Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to the third and final day of MDDI's Focus on Fundamentals. It's a master class on reusable medical device cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization validations. It's sponsored by Nelson Labs and broadcast by Informa. Today is day three, and we'll be discussing sterilization validations. My name is Peter Kras. I'll be your moderator today. And before we get started, I have a few very quick announcements. First of all, this webinar is designed to be interactive. There's a dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen, and they will allow you to learn about today's speaker, download resources, and participate in the Q&A session that we'll have toward the end of the presentation. Uh, these slides will advance automatically throughout the event. And finally, if you experience any technical issues during this webinar, you have a couple of options. One, you can click the help widget that's at the bottom of the screen, or you can type your issue right into the Q&A. And right, either way, we'll be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And with that, let's move on to our day three presentation. It's entitled, A Basic Overview of sterilization validations for reusable medical devices. And discussing the topic today is Jason Poe. Jason is a senior scientist at Nelson Labs. And if you'd like to learn more about Jason, check out the BIOS widget. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jason Poe. Jason. Thank you, Peter. Okay, as stated, we're going to cover steam sterilization validations in particular. And why steam sterilization? Well, steam sterilization of the various modalities that are available in healthcare facilities, steam is by far the most common. So um, due to our limited time, that's where we're going to focus our attention. However, a lot of these concepts are going to apply to other modalities as well. So keep that in mind while we go through the, the content. So why is steam sterilization so popular in healthcare facilities? It's an inexpensive compared to other modalities. There are fewer critical parameters in other modalities, so it's easier to monitor and to validate. Steam sterilization is also very effective and it's time proven. So it, it makes for a very good modality to use in hospitals and clinics. Some of the benefits to steam sterilization include that it's uh, very widely used and understood. It's dependable, non-toxic, it has a rapid killing action, and it's relatively inexpensive. So um, sterilization is just one part of the uh, reusable medical device process where we go through cleaning, disinfection, and then sterilization. Sterilization is a very important part of that process. So when we go through a steam sterilization validation, one of the first things we need to think about are the um, sample sizes that we are going to use for validation. Some of that may be dependent on our chamber volume. So generally, when we perform a validation, we'll ask for one completely populated tray if we're validating a sterilization set, or we'll ask for a minimum of three devices if we're validating an individual device. So one thing to note very quickly is that the moist heat document um, published by ISO is moving into the uh, final draft international stage. So um, we are very close to publishing the new revision of this document. Um, as some of you may be aware, that uh, is currently in three parts. That, will, that new revision will consolidate everything into a single document. It will have expanded microbiological validation guidance. It will have expanded healthcare sterilization guidance. And it will also have expanded industrial sterilization guidance, among other things. One thing that we need to ask ourselves when we are choosing a modality um, to validate for our medical device, if we're looking at STEAM, we need to ask, is STEAM the appropriate sterilization modality for our test article? 
um, for example, are the materials of construction compatible with the uh, parameters that are presented by steam sterilization. In particular, you have uh, moisture and you have high heat, so you need to make sure your device can, can withstand those um, things. And we also um, need to look at the lifespan of the device. Have we considered that? Um, maybe we can sterilize our device with steam. However, it would reduce our lifespan considerably. So that's one thing we need to look at. Uh, we also need to consider if there are other modalities that might be a better fit. Maybe we have a heat sensitive device and something like VHP gas plasma would be a better choice. And um, there are also other modalities we can consider. There is EO sterilization. However, the popularity of EO sterilization is dropping in healthcare facilities due to concerns with residues and safety and dry heat sterilization may or may not be available. Uh, we tend to see that it's not real common in healthcare. So first let's talk about the overkill method and validation approaches for items to be sterilized in healthcare facilities. So the first thing that we need to consider is the sterility assurance level validation. Um, we can use half cycle or full cycle parameters with that. However, we need to make a, a choice when we design our validation. So what is the overkill method? Um, ISO 11139 defines it as a method of defining a sterilization process that achieves a maximal sterility assurance level for products substantially less than 10 to the sixth. And we further define that, or, or I should say describe that in ISO TS 17665-2 Annex B. Um, there we have two descriptions of an overkill process for moist heat. The first one, is a sterilization process calculated to provide a minimum 12 log reduction of microorganisms having a devalue of one minute at 121C. That's uh, very closely associated with traditional sterilization of 121 uh, for a period of 15 minutes. The other is a sterilization process that delivers lethality in excess of what is required to destroy the bio burden. So um, how do we address bio burden resistance in a reusable validation? Um, the first thing that's worth noting is that bio burden resistance devalues very rarely exceed one minute at 121C. In fact, for bio burden isolates, the most resistant I currently have experience with uh, would be a devalue at 121 of 0 0.3 minutes. Most everything is going to be a fraction of that. For items that are processed in healthcare facilities, it's really not realistic for us to monitor pre-sterilization bio burden levels because each facility is going to be different and will contribute unique types and levels of bio burden to the device. Um, you know, we also have um, different people performing those cleaning steps and disinfection steps. So instead, we use that cleaning validation to demonstrate that we are able to adequate, adequately remove soil from the device before we perform sterilization. The BIs that we select for an overkill, overkill process um, are going to allow us to measure the full cycle lethality um, where we are looking at achieving at least a 12 log reduction with the full cycle process for an organism that has a D121 value of uh, greater than or equal to 1.0 minutes. And this is performed by examining the F bio value and the calculation is listed there below where we look at the D value and the log of the population. So the first validation approach that we have available to us um, in, the, in the ISO standard, it will be listed as the pi partial cycle approach. However, a lot of people will refer to this as the half cycle approach. This, um, this approach uh, uses half of the routine processing time to demonstrate the required lethality. BIs must have a BIF bio value of at least six minutes. That allows us 
through complete inactivation of that BI to demonstrate a six log reduction of a microorganism that has a D value of 1.0 minutes. Once we demonstrate that in our half cycle time, the exposure time is doubled for the full processing time. The other option we have available to us, although this is used much less commonly uh, for these types of validations, is the full cycle approach. Uh, for, for this to work, we must have BIs that have very high resistance values. In fact, we need to have a BI that demonstrates an F bio value of at least 12 minutes plus the addition of a safety factor. And that safety factor uh, basically boils down to the addition of half of a log to the population required to achieve an F bio value of 12 minutes. So in reality, you're looking at a BI that's presenting a resistance closer to 13 minutes. And for both methods, whether we're using the half cycle approach or the full cycle approach, we need to demonstrate complete BI inactivation. So as stated, the first step of the process is to validate the lethality. In the lethality validation, there are certain things we need to uh, address when we're putting that validation together. Um, the, the process flow is basically that we will select inoculation locations for our test article. We will inoculate that product, package it, expose the product to our validation conditions, perform a sterility test on those biological indicators, and then score them for growth. This is a common, this is an example of a common test article that we might see when performing a validation for a reusable device customer. However, we do see quite a variety. When we're validating lethality, we really need to make some decisions before we start testing. We need to decide what cycle will we be validating? Do, has the selected cycle been 510K cleared? Uh, for, you know, is it part of a, a machine that has been 510K cleared? What packaging do we need for the processing? And does that packaging have 510K clearance for that selected set of cycle parameters? What accessories are needed for processing and are they 510K cleared? And finally, what validation approach will we be using? As stated, the half cycle approach or also called the partial cycle approach is very common commonly used for these types of devices. The full cycle approach is used less commonly and, and that oftentimes is better applied uh, in industrial type validations. So the first step is what cycle will we choose to validate? We should choose a cycle as stated that has been 510K cleared for sterilizer that has been 510K cleared. Now we can look at uh, a number of industry documents if we need help deciding the cycle that we would like to validate. An example would be ANSI AMI ST8 or the FDA guidance document. And we also need to understand for our end users, do they have the capability to perform the cycle we choose to validate? Uh, as an example, we would not want to validate selected European cycles for use in the US. The next step, we need to decide what packaging we want to use during our validation that will be included in the uh, device instructions for use. Does the manufacturer intend to have the test article wrapped, pouched, or placed into a rigid container? Sometimes we see a combination. It's very common to see uh, test article set that is wrapped and placed into a rigid container as two separate packaging options. Um, and it is common to validate multiple packaging configurations for a device or a device set. Is the selected packaging 510K cleared for that particular sterilization cycle that we would like to validate? And can the end users obtain the selected packaging? 
when they follow the manufacturer's instructions for use. We also, as stated, we need to look at the accessories. Um, are we going to require a tray liner for processing? Do we need to include silicone pin mats in our set? Do we need to uh, validate with tamper evidence seals or any other accessories that might be required by the end user to properly process the device? And can those end users obtain those accessories When we select the, as stated, when we select the validation approach, um, I tend to prefer to use the half cycle approach. It's more traditional. It's understood by more uh, folks in the industry. However, uh, depending on the resistance of the BIs that you have available for testing, you may find that your BIs are, are very, very resistant and the full cycle approach might be a better option. However, as stated, it's, it's much less common in the industry and it tends to be applied better when we're validating industrial processes. So when we're validating lethality, we need to select the biological indicators that we're going to use, perform product inoculation, product packaging. We need to load the chamber expose the product and test the BIs. So when we select the BIs for testing, we need to ensure that the BIs provide the necessary challenge to successfully validate the process. Um, we need to use the appropriate microorganism. We need to select an appropriate population. We need to examine the minimum D value reported by the manufacturer to ensure that it meets uh, all regulatory requirements and additionally provides an appropriate challenge for our validation. We need to make sure that it meets the minimum Z value requirements of industry documents. Uh, we, also, we often measure that challenge by looking at the F, uh, BIF bio value. Uh, if you have any questions regarding uh, minimum D values, Z values, populations, a good document to examine is ISO 11138-3. So we have different carrier types that we can use to, to inoculate our product and we need to select those carefully. Um, we tend to default to spore strips because they're very easy to test. They provide consistent results and they're just generally easy to work with. However, they do present a problem. They won't fit into a lot of difficult to sterilize locations. And we need to ensure that we are testing those areas that are the most difficult to sterilize on the product. So if we can't use a spore strip, there are other carrier types that we could try to use. We could use BI spore sutures. Those provide good cons consistency when we test those and they can be used to reach tight areas and also to reach the center portion of cannulas where we may need to test. Uh, for dead-ended cannulas, we may need to place those at the very end of that cannula. We could also use spore wires. They provide good consistency and um, they also can be used to reach tight areas. They provide some rigidity, which can be helpful if we need to feed those down long uh, cannulas and lumens. Uh, those may have to be prepared in-house. Uh, they can sometimes be difficult to find uh, commercially available. So um, if you do need to prepare those, that preparation can be very labor intensive. Now, we do find with some products that we can't inoculate with any carrier type in those cases, we would de uh, go to a BI spore suspension. Um, the, that inoculation tends to provide less consistent results. It's very uh, technician dependent when it is applied. So there needs to be a high level of training for those using that spore suspension. And it also requires drying, which can add time to the validation turnaround. 
when we inoculate the product, we, as stated, we need to select locations that present steam sterilization challenges, uh, mated surfaces, crevices, areas of large mass that may have an insulating effect, lumens and channels, hollow areas, and some of the most difficult to sterilize locations actually can be insulated lumens, channels, and hollow areas where, uh, for example, we may have a channel and we need to heat that from the inside and the outside. And because we're heating it from the inside, we actually form condensate in the channel and that can occlude steam penetration. So those can be very difficult to sterilize. Then we also need to make sure that we aren't discounting any other types of challenges to air removal and steam penetration. Once we place those BI carriers, do the BIs need to be anchored in place so that they can be retrieved during uh, testing? Is drying required for direct inoculation? If so, how are we going to verify that drying has occurred? Have BI locations been documented to allow for retrieval during testing? And do we require specialized sterile tools for BI removal and testing? And then any other considerations for testing that we need to address before we package those items? Here we just have some photos of various uh, product inoculation techniques. Um, here we're working with uh, sutures, wires, and spore strips. And in this particular photo, we have some examples of potential inoculation sites that might be chosen for a test article set. Now, once we've inoculated our product, we need to package the device. So we need to select the appropriate packaging uh, for wrappers, pouches, or rigid containers. We need to select the manufacturer that we're going to, for, for which, whose product we, we're going to use. We need to select the size of the wrappers, pouches, or rigid containers that are going to be used uh, for wrappers, and pouches, we need to select the wrapping technique or whether we're going to single or double pouch items. For rigid containers, we need to select the filter material if that's applicable. Some rigid containers will use valves um, and in that case, a filter material may not be required. And most importantly, we need to make sure whatever packaging we select, is it 510K cleared for the test cycle parameters? And here are some examples of wrappers, rigid containers, and pouches. Once the device has been packaged, we need to load it into the chamber. We need to decide, are we validating in a maximum loading configuration? Are we going to validate in a minimum loading configuration? Or are we going to test both? Uh, testing both would definitely be worst case. Depending on the set of parameters, we may be able to test only a maximum loading. That may be worst case. And there may be examples of when minimum loading might be worst case. If we're really concerned about, say, for example, air removal in the chamber, minimum loading might present the worst case configuration there. I tend to recommend both if there are any questions. We need to document where we place the test article and if we're running a maximum load, where we uh, place any other items, uh, including dunnage material. We need to document the orientation of our items, um, where they stood on end, where they placed length, lengthwise or widthwise. And um, we also need to state where the product is in relation to the cold spot in the chamber. Generally, we're going to want to place that directly into that chamber cold spot to represent a worst case testing scenario. Here are a couple views of our steam steril of a steam sterilization chamber. This is what we might consider to be a smaller healthcare unit. Um, as some of you uh, I'm sure are aware, those uh, healthcare units can be very large. You may see floor loading units 
or units that require carts for loading. So when we select the cycle, we'll need to specify that in our test procedures and in our validation protocol. Are we validating a pre-vacuum or gravity cycle? If it's, pre, if it's a pre-vacuum cycle, do we need to specify the number of preconditioning pulses? Uh, what's the exposure temperature, exposure time, and drying time? For lethality testing, we do set that drying time at zero minutes to represent worst case conditions. Once we expose that product, we need to test the BIs that are inside of that product. So upon completion of the sterilization cycles, we need to remove that test article from the chamber and transfer it to our testing area or testing hood and allow it to cool. Uh, when those come out, they're very, very hot. And so a certain amount of time will be required so that the analysts can handle the product safely. For BI carriers, we would transfer those aseptically into test media containers. And we use a, a general growth media, uh, soybean casein digest broth, or also referred to as triptych soy broth. When, a, when we are testing components that are directly inoculated, we need to transfer those inoculated components into an appropriate volume of growth media. And for that, particular type of testing where we're testing directly inoculated components, we need to ensure that we have performed method suitability testing um, so that we can ensure that any surviving microorganisms will be recovered by that test. Once we've tested everything and placed it into growth media, it would be a, uh, incubated for the appropriate period of time which is generally going to be uh, greater than or equal to seven days. Uh, temp common temperature would be 55 to 60 degrees C. Uh, once we go through that minimum incubation period, we would score those containers for growth or no growth. Okay. The next part of our validation, once we've gone through and demonstrated in three consecutive cycles that we are able to completely inactivate our BIs with the appropriate uh, sterilization validation parameters, the next thing we need to consider is temperature profiling. Now, one note about temperature profiling, it can be performed during the lethality testing. It can be performed during the drying validation, which we will get into after we talk about temperature profiling. However, there are some concerns there, and so I will cover those. So temperature profiling is pretty simple. We need to program our thermocouples or temperature probes and place them strategically inside the product and chamber. Uh, common areas are going to be uh, areas that represent the BI locations. We're gonna package the product once we place those thermocouples. We're gonna place the required chamber uh, thermocouples into the chamber. We'll expose the product and then download the thermocouple data. The temperature profiling results allow us to confirm the microbiological test results. When we're performing profiling, we need to remember that we need to perform calibration verification with those probes or thermo thermocouples. Um, the expectation is generally that that will be conducted pre-study and post-study. As stated, those uh, temperature probes are going to be placed into uh, areas that are difficult for air removal and steam penetration. Generally, that's going to correspond with your BI monitoring locations. You can perform profiling in your half cycles during the lethality testing, uh, or you can perform that during the full cycles. When we analyze the temperature profiles, do they um, agree with our BI results? Do our F bio values and our F sub O values agree? And do they, uh, where required, demonstrate that the load is within acceptable ranges during exposure? 
a common range might be negative zero degrees C and plus three degrees C from the exposure temperature set point. You could find that in various industry documents. Some common issues with temperature profiling. The first thing we need to remember is that recorded temperatures don't tell us anything about steam quality. They only record the temperature. So we have a temperature, but we do not know whether we have saturated steam conditions at that location. Um, it may also be difficult to place those probes into some of our tighter BI locations. So um, in that case, we may need to place as close to that location as we can or simulate a location that is comparable to the BI location. Sometimes probes will malfunction during the cycles and that can be problematic in some cases. When placed into some products and device sets, the probes can actually add additional mass that may trigger BI failures and drying failures. And that is why we may want to consider profiling in separate cycles. And I have seen this happen in the lab on more than one occasion. And we also need to remember that small probe measurement error can uh, result in large F sub O value error. And that's due to the way that is calculated. It is a exponential equation. This in it here is an example of a pre-vacuum full cycle. You can see in there our preconditioning pulses, our exposure phase, and the drying phase before we vent and come out of that exposure um, the, the outside of the chamber. So the third portion that we have uh, that we need to validate would be the drying. Why is drying important? Well, um, if we have semi-permeable materials such as wrap materials, uh, filter materials, pouch materials, those wet semi-permeable materials can become penetrable to microorganisms when they're wet and saturated. And then water inside a packaged test article can provide an environment for microbiological growth so the drying time validation is actually quite simple. We prepare and weigh packaging. We package the devices or trays and weigh that package device as required. We expose the product. We visually inspect for moisture on packaging and product, and we reweigh package device as required. We would then open that um, or, or remove that packaging from the, the test article and reweigh the packaging. So when we validate drying, we need to select the performance criteria that we're going to test to. So there are two sets of guidance that I uh, refer to quite commonly. The first one would be ISO 17665-2 Annex B. That annex is when we are validating primarily with biological methods and uh, complementing it with physical methods, where we would look at a weight gain of less than or equal to 3% for absorbable materials. If we're following ISO 17665-2 Annex A, which is primarily for methods that are validated with physical um, measurement, the weight gain of the package must be less than 0.2% for metals and 1.0% for fabrics. So for absorbable materials, we would want to weigh those prior to packaging. Um, absorbable materials may include wraps, pouches, filters, gauze, towels, and any other absorbable material types that would be present in the test pack. And when we're looking at test pack weight, we would weigh the entire package test article and record that way. So when we're packaging, we want to make sure that we package in the same manner as was validated for lethality. We re would record the text, test article packaging configuration, all pre-weights, 
uh, that were taken, et cetera, prior to performing the exposure. We would load the chamber as required for the test configuration. So if we're testing maximum loading, we would include our dunnage material for minimum loading. It would likely be only our test article. We would expose the load to the full steam sterilization process, including drying time and all cool down steps that may be incorporated into that cycle. Once that cycle is complete, we would transfer to a wire rack where we would perform evaluation. We, when we place that test article on a wire rack outside of the chamber, we need to avoid placing it on cold surfaces as condensation could form. We also need to avoid areas where air conditioning might be present or cold air could interact with the product and form condensation. So once we remove that item from the chamber, we need to perform our post weights and our visual inspection. We would examine the outside surfaces of the packaging. We would weigh the pack if that's required, remove the wrap material, pouches, filters, and weigh all absorbable materials if that's appropriate. Examine all packaging surfaces inside and outside for the presence of visual moisture we would examine all surfaces of the test article for the presence of moisture. That would include the inside and outside of all surfaces of that test article. We would then record all of our weights, observations, et cetera, and calculate our weight gains, and then take a look at our test results. Um, do they meet the performance criteria that we have selected for validation? If we have drying validation failures, how might we address those? Um, can we use a lower grade of packaging? Did we maybe select uh, a, a very high weight grade of a wrap material to represent worst case conditions? If so, can we reduce that down and still stay within the packaging manufacturer's instructions for use? Uh, could we include a tray liner to aid drying? Can the devices and components be repositioned in the tray or chamber to allow for more effective water drainage? And could we reduce the mass of the device or device set to aid in drying? So those are some of the options we might have available. And before we move into device lubrication, I just wanna mention that um, extended drying times tend to be accepted by regulatory agencies. However, if we make those extended drying times too long, uh, we can run into issues where a healthcare facility would rather not run that long drying time. Um, once we hit about 45 to 60 minutes of drying, that can become an issue. So we need to keep that in mind. And finally, just some notes regarding device lubrication. Some devices might require lubrication prior to sterilization as built into the device IFU. If lubrication is required, it should be cleared for sterilization applications. It should not contain compounds that present biocompatibility or cytotoxicity issues. Testing must be performed with the lubrication step added into the procedure, I have seen validations where the lubrication was not included in testing and the device was not cleared because that was not included in testing. Where the lubricant can contact our BI carriers or um, anywhere where our BI organisms might be placed, we need to perform method suitability to show that the lubricant does not um, cause issues with recovering growth of a small number of survivors. The lubricant would need to then, you know, once we successfully validate with the lubricant, we would need to include that in our device instructions for use. And lubrication steps must be included as well so that the, the, the um, manufacturer, or the, I'm sorry, the end user understands exactly what is needed to lubricate the device appropriately. 
So here I've listed a, uh, a number of documents that we refer to when we perform these validations. I don't want to spend much time here because we're just a little bit over time, but those are available on the slides there. And that concludes our presentation today. So I'd like to hand time back to Peter as our moderator, and we can go into our Q&A. Great, thanks, Jason. All right, we're going to go to Q&A. Before we do, however, I'd like to ask everyone to please direct your attention to the webinar survey. It's available on the right of your presentation window. If you've already closed the survey, you can reopen the widget, just click the icon along the bottom of your screen. Thanks in advance for filling out the feedback form. Your participation in this survey can help us serve you better in the future. All right, let's move on to Q&A. There's still time, you can submit your questions. Uh, just type your question into the text box that's located to the right of the presentation window, or just click the Q&A icon. That's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we've got a lot of questions, so uh, we'll try to get them all answered, but if we don't, if we miss a few, we'll share them with Jason and he can reply to you uh, offline. All right, let us go to our first question. Uh, okay, here we go. Once a question, sorry, once a device has been FDA approved for low sterilization, does it matter whose low temperature sterilizer is used? We have not seen that be, re be a requirement. One thing I have seen quite commonly on IFUs is that there will be a statement indicating what sterilizer uh, manufacturer and model was used for the validation testing. But I, I have not seen the FDA require that it be only sterilized in that particular manufacturer's chamber. So, um, I hope that answers the question. If not, uh, please uh, submit a follow-up. Okay, thanks. Our next question. Where are the microorganisms tested? Is it on the device or on a plate? When, when we perform the BI sterility testing, if we use BI carriers, those carriers are tested for uh, uh, inactivation of the indicator microorganism. Now, if we're performing direct inoculation with the device component, we would actually take that physical product device component and immerse that into the media. But it's tested in a liquid media, and it's a qualitative test. We're looking for growth or no growth. And what we want to see with successful lethality cycles is that we completely inactivate those BIs. So we would want to see no growth of that liquid growth medium. Great, okay, Jason, here's our next question. It has to do with weights. What is the maximum weight we can load in a pack? And is there any uh, challenge to sterilization due to weight? Yeah, weight can, can you can push a set into a failing scenario if it's overloaded. Um, generally, we see that the maximum loading is going to be 25 pounds. I believe that's an OSHA requirement. It is uh, outlined in multiple industry documents. Uh, I believe one of the documents you would want to check is ANSI Amy ST77. Also check ST79. It may be in one or both of those documents. Um, I can't remember if it's in both or not. But um, yeah, 25 pounds is really the maximum that we see. And if you push the weight beyond there, say you're, you're trying to test with a worst case configuration, you can actually trigger failures because we've got so much mass in that set that um, we are unable to achieve the lethality that we need to. Also, it can present drying issues because the more mass you have, you've got to heat that mass up. And when you're heating that mass up, you're forming condensate. And we need to get that condensate out so that we dry the product effectively. So um, I would say your maximum weight is going to be 25 pounds. 
Very good, thank you. All right, next question. What is a cold spot in a chamber? What's a cold spot? A cold spot, when, now, now imagine you have a sterilization chamber. You've got a lot of space in there. When you heat that, that chamber up, it's going to have a range in which it performs. So you, you are generally going to have a location where it is hotter throughout the cycle than the rest of those locations that would represent the upper end of your range. And then you would have a cold location that's going to represent the lower portion of your range. When we test, if we know that a chamber tends to present a cold spot, say for example, on the bottom level near the drain by the door, we would want to place our test articles into that location. And that generally is a common cold spot. If you're uh, above that drain uh, on the bottom level near the door, that tends to present a, a cold spot in a lot of um, uh, loaded chambers. One thing that um, you, you need to keep in mind is that when those chambers are profiled empty, you may see that all of your temperatures are within the um, air of those probes. And so it, it's difficult to pick a cold spot. So um, you may have to go to maximum loading profiles to find that. And that's something that you would generally identify when you're performing your uh, performance qualification on the chamber itself. Hmm. Okay. All right, uh, here's our next question. Um, if a medical device cannot be sterilized in half cycle using the half cycle procedure, what other possibilities or options do we have? That's a tough one. Um, generally, most medical devices are going to fall in those common um, cycles that are available in healthcare settings. Um, if, if it does not fall, into those cycles, the first thing we might need to look at is can we change the configuration of that device to make it fit into those common cycles? So maybe we have a device, we're testing it in, in a, an assembled configuration and we see failures. So maybe we need to disassemble that device to make it work with that cycle. Um, maybe we need to reconfigure it if we have a device set, maybe we need to split those into two separate sets to optimize air removal and steam penetration. Um, we might need to look at the packaging. Have we selected the packaging that allows for the most steam penetration and air removal? Maybe there's a better packaging um, solution for our device. So there are things we look at. Um, if none of that works, I have seen a, just a very few number of instances where an extended cycle was allowed. However, I will state that I was not involved on the regulatory side of that. So I don't know how that was presented to the agency and what kind of discussions were held with the agency regarding those extended cycles. Generally, the FDA is not going to accept any extended cycle parameters. So um, keep that in mind. So th those are a few options. Um, I, I hope that answers the question for you. That's great, thank you. Uh, next question is sort of a definition one. Uh, simply, what is 510K? A 510K is regulatory clearance. Um, it, it's where we have a device where uh, a predicate device can be selected to compare to. And um, what you're basically showing in your submission is that your device is substantially equivalent to that device that's already on the market. But basically it gives you market clearance to sell your device to healthcare facilities um, for use. I hope that answers the question. I am not a regulatory yeah. expert, so um, there, there may be others that can better answer the question. So if you have any follow-up, let me know and I'll involve those folks. Sure, that's a good start though, I think. Okay, uh, the next question, 
can a worst case cycle be justified in a validation to cover all possible cycles that that may be used or does every possible cycle need to be directly validated there are some choices we can make um, I tend to refer to those choices as the use of hybrid parameters. We may need to, uh, if we're going to take that approach, we may look at a group of cycles and choose the worst case temperature and the worst case exposure time to try to validate those as a group. In some cases, that can be successful. In other cases, you, you've made so many worst case decisions that you can run into issues. So it really depends how, how complex is the device? Do we think it will pass with those hybrid parameters? That is an option. And that's something if you're testing uh, with us or if I'm helping you with your validation, I, I can advise um, with your, your device, you know, knowledge of your device and knowledge of those cycles. It is an option. Um, it may or may not be appropriate depending on your device. Okay, very good. Uh, next question is a two-parter. Here's the first part. For pre-vacuum autoclave cycle, how many evacuation pulses are used for tray sterilization validation? And then the second part is, and do you know of any standards that dictate the number of evacuation pulses? I am not aware of any standards that dictate the number of pulses for this type of validation testing. Um, what we do is we use whatever the manufacturer has validated as part of their process. So if they have validated a three pulse cycle, then we would use three pulses. If that uh, sterilizer manufacturer has validated four pulses as um, part of their process, then we would use four pulses. And that's something that we've seen very good acceptance with FDA um, when they uh, are, are notified of the number of pulses that were used for validation. Uh, some manufacturers may choose to use a worst case setting. So um, commonly in the industry, you'll see cycles with three pulses or four, four pulses. So that device manufacturer may choose to validate with three pulses to represent um, a, a more broad base of chambers out there. And that also has been accepted well. You need to be careful though, because those are, are going to be specific to each manufacturer. And that represents your air removal and, and, and your stage where you're replacing air with steam. So if you have inadequate air removal, you may see issues in your validation. So you have to be careful there. Great, okay. Uh, here's another question. If, uh, sorry, when performing a half cycle validation, does the accumulated lethality need to be 12 or can it be six because it's a half cycle? With, with a half cycle validation, we're, we're generally looking to show complete activation of BIs that present an F bio value of six minutes or greater. And with half cycle conditions, that result would be extrapolated out to the required 12 minute um, process at bio value. Okay. All right. Um, here's the next question then. Um, can temperature profiling be combined with lethality testing or drying testing? Yeah, it can be combined with either or both. Um, the, the thing you need to keep in mind, though, is if you're, let's say, for example, you're using self-contained temperature probes to perform your profiling, those will add mass and surface area to the product. So you want to make sure if, if that is the case, if, if you're combining it with BI, testing, you may create a situation where the added mass of those probes could present issues with your BI lethality. Because of that, I tend to like to do that with separate cycles. The profiling I tend to like to do with separate cycles. However, it can be combined with the lethality 
or the drying or both. Great, Jason. All right, here's the next question. Uh, can all instruments be sterilized using a low temperature sterilizer? I'm assuming here that we're talking about something like um, vaporized hydrogen peroxide. Um, one thing you need to look at if you're choosing a modality like that, you need to look at the, the clearance for those, those sterilizers. Does the, the, um, do the instructions for use and the clearance allow for, say, long lumens, long cannulas, or does it present limits on diameter and length of cannulas? So uh, a lot of devices can be sterilized through those, but there are limitations. Um, those may be imposed by the sterilizer manufacturer, or they may be imposed by the device itself. Um, you may run into penetration issues. Um, EO penetrates very, very well. However, with VHP, gas plasma, there are limitations to how deeply you can penetrate into some products. So you just need to be aware of that. Make sure you check the um, labeling. I, I would suggest you reach out to that sterilizer manufacturer for guidance there. Okay. We have time for just a couple more. Uh, here's one. Uh, Regarding half cycle versus full cycle approach, which is better for validation? Is it better to validate with half cycle or full cycle? For reusable device validations, my preference is to validate with half cycle conditions. It's more, it's gonna be much more recognized by um, those who may be reviewing the submission. And um, there, there's, there, it's just been around so much longer that you, you're likely to have fewer issues uh, from re regulators. Having said that, um, there are times where a full cycle approach may be appropriate. And I would suggest that you, um, whichever sterilization expert you're working with, that you involve them in those discussions. Um, they can provide additional feedback on um, which approach would be most appropriate for your device and considering the BIs that you may have available for testing. Okay, uh, looks like we have time to squeeze in one more question. This has to do with drying times. Uh, do drying times ever exceed 20 to 30 minutes? And if so, does the FDA accept extended drying times? I think you mentioned uh, 45 to 60 is something like a max. Yeah, I've seen some drying times that have exceeded 60 minutes. Um, those those are, are relatively rare. It may be where we have a very, very massive device and the, there's just really no other option. Um, because of the mass, we're just forming so much condensate, it just takes a long time to dry that device. But um, there are times where an extended drying time is going to be necessary. A lot of device sets are going to require longer than 20 to 30 minutes. Um, but we, we try to keep those as short as possible because we don't want to create a situation where healthcare facilities are, are unwilling to run those extended drying times. So I would say if we're, if we're exceeding 60 minutes, we really need to evaluate maybe the, the configuration of the set and um, look at other options to aid with drying. But um, uh, short answer to the question is yes, uh, extended drying times are allowed and they are accepted by FDA. Okay. Well, and we're coming up on the top of the hour. Jason, any closing statements before we say goodbye? No, I just want to thank everybody very much for your time. Um, I tried to squeeze in a lot of material in a short amount of time. So if you have any follow-up questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer those um, outside of this webinar. So uh, just let me know. I'm, I'm happy to help where I can. Thanks, Jason. Uh, we really appreciate your time and expertise today. And I'd like to thank our sponsor, Nelson Labs, as well as everyone out there in the audience. We appreciate your attention and participation. Within the next few hours, you'll receive a personalized follow-up email it will contain details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Uh, please, if you have colleagues or peers who couldn't join us today, 
let them know they can listen to this event on demand. Also, if you missed any of the previous uh, three-day uh, series, be sure to click the Register Now button that's in your viewing window, and this will give you access to all three sessions on demand. This webinar is copyright 2023 by Informa. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Informa Markets, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. On behalf of our guest speaker, Jason Pope, I'm Peter Krauss. Thanks for your time and have a great rest of your day.